Now, this newer thing is just reduced to the old thing. Okay? But, I want to give you, just walk you through an example, that this example here, just so that you can see that you have done some numerics, okay? So here is the numerics. Um, so you have, uh, the, uh, basically this is the data you have, and this is going to be your network. And if you, and you know what probabilities you have to compute, right? Because you know base networks, you know that if I give you a base network, then for the first guy, we need to give the probability that will take each of the values given its parents. Since it has no parents, it's just the prior probability of will be taking yes, prior probability of will be taking no. What would MLE say? What would MLE say? Look at the will wait. Okay? How many times are there? 12. How many times is it yes? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So what is the prior probability of will wait? 0.5, 6 by 12, 0.5. Don't look that big. This is just fractions. You may be looking for something much bigger, but there isn't anything. In fact, what you did is you have realized that for complete, for complete data and tabular representations, learning base network parameters is taking fractions. You know, anybody who's been talked multiple times on their head should still be able to. But the interesting thing is it works. Just like looking for lines seems to work in general in our lives. That's why we keep looking for lines. And knife based classifier hands on because it actually works in many, many cases. Even though there is no reason to believe that that is actually the way to write the distribution. Remember that when you assume this is the base network, you made a huge number of you made a huge number of independence assertions. For example, you are making the assertion, <coughs> assumption that all attributes are independent of each other given the class value. Right? Because you know this in, in base networks, if win rate is given, R is independent of R. Because that's just the definition of conditional independence in base networks. The real question is, do you actually believe that in real world? It may not be true in the real world because there may be many attributes that are correlated beyond the class variable. They are correlated beyond the class variable. That's the part that you're going to miss in modeling. But the advantage you are getting is you can get by with much fewer parameters. The other thing you could have done, by the way, is you could have essentially made a complete Bayesian network a complete base network on all these variables. That way nobody could ever question whether or not you have done the right thing. Because remember, in, if in doubt, put more edges. <laughs> when you do that, it turns out it's not any harder. Because even if you have a complete network, the CPTs, you can just take them as parameters, as, as, as ratios. It's just that now there are a lot more numbers that you are trying to assess. The number of examples are still 12. If you ever find yourself starting from 12 training examples and creating 300 parameters, you should ask yourself, am I in the right business? <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So to really get those 300 parameters correct, you need a lot more than 12 examples. If not, in essence, you are overfitting to the data. So you use nine base classifier because not because you could not have used the full, you know, full um, network topology, which is one way of making sure that I'm not wrong. You know, I'm ensure that every possible calculation is taken into account. It's not because you can't actually compute the ratios there, it is that the ratios you compute there are likely to be even more wrong than what you're computing here. Now, who is getting to decide this? Who's going to decide this? The way you decide it is the way you decide every possible learning algorithm's performance. So if your friend wants to learn a complete network on these 12 variables, and you want to learn the nine base classifier on these 12 western examples, I happen to have another 20 that I stored in, or another 6 that I stored in, 
for which I know whether Russell actually waited or not. And I'm going to test both what you learned and what your friend learned on that held out data. And to the extent your friend fails and you succeed, I'll say, fine, you, what you're doing, then I base classifier seems to work better. Since I'm teaching you this, it's because, in fact, my base classifier works better than assuming the other extreme. Now, notice this is not the simplest network that you could have made on these variables. What's the simplest network you could have made on these variables? No edges. But that would be sort of being really dropped on your head. So you're saying class is completely disconnected to attitude. That's like going too far in assuming independence. You see what I'm saying? That's what my base classifier is. Okay. So in fact, you could actually also think in radius is six by twelve. And now, if I want to say patterns full given will radius, patterns are this. Okay. How many? What's the probability that patterns is full given will rate equal to yes? Okay, so then I would consider all these red rows where bill weight is yes. There are six of them. Okay, so I put six in the denominator. And then I look in those red rows, how many times are patterns true? One and two. Basically, two times the patterns are true. So I essentially just two by six. One, two. Is this enough numerics? Or should I go through more of it? Essentially, you're just looking at, you know, for each random probability, you look at essentially will rate equal to yes, given that equal to sum, will be, you know, you count the number of win rates, which are six, and the sum, uh, and, uh, and the number of those rows where that is equal to sum, that's four, so four by six. When you do this, in the end, you have the right base classifier. Now, if I give you a new example, if I give you a new example, where I tell you all the values of the attributes, and I ask you, would Russell wait? In fact, one of the interesting things is, even before I give you the examples, I ask you, will Russell wait? And you say, 50-50. Ah, Why? Because probability of waiting, given nothing, is 0.5. You're not just saying because you don't want to think. You're actually thinking and saying, before you even told me the story, if you say I'm talking about Russell um, scenario, I'll say 50. It's the same thing. So if I come and say, hey, a patient is coming, what do you think is the probability that he's suffering from, he or she is suffering from a bullet? And 10 power minus 9. Because this is 10 before final you know, There aren't too many people you know, going around with it. And then they will come and you get the features. You get their attributes, you get their symptoms, their running nose, things are falling off, etc. And then you, you compute the posterior and Ebola given the features. When I give the rest of the Russell example, you recompute the posterior and will be given all the features. That's what my base classifier tells you. Remember in a base network, I can always give you some evidence and ask for the posterior and some no. In my base classifier, normally, I'll give you evidence on all the attributes and I'll ask you for the posterior and the parent. The only parent is the class. So I get the posterior classification on the class. So class being yes, class being no. And whichever is the higher probability, you just take. You see what I'm saying? This is it. This is my base classifier. This works. In many, many problems, this just works fine. Okay? Now, a few small changes you might want to do into this night base classifier, and you should be able to understand why. Essentially, just randomly taking these, uh, these uh, ratios could be too off if, in fact, there are not enough examples. In particular, if there are rare conditions, for example, there are certain rare um, symptoms, the probability for them will wind up being zero. The conditional probability table for that, that particular entry will wind up being zero from the examples. Because you would have, for example, said, let's say, um, what's the probability uh, that will uh, rate equal to yes when that is equal to full? And maybe in your data, it was only three, three or four data points, and that's a big stop, big rate, then the restaurant happened before. 
So you would say zero is the probability for you know the Russell's baking gender estimates. You should be careful about zeros. Zeros are forever in probability. Are you really sure? Because once you put a zero, then essentially that can how much our additional data you look at. I mean, you'll essentially be using this zero as your parameter, and so you can be quite wrong. So that's where the, the thing that I mentioned in the example again, in the, in, in the links that I sent in the class, after the last class, uh, the Cromwell group, Cromwell's group comes in. Essentially, uh, Oliver Cromwell told, I guess, this bunch of church people that I beseech you in the world of Christ. Think it possible you may be mistaken. Don't just go by the data. If the data is very big, maybe fine, but I don't, I don't know whether the data is big. Okay? So you want to hedge your bets. You want to not allow zeros to be. You can think of it that way. But really, you guys should be able to see what you're trying to do here. Nine base classifier is a special case of base network, complete base network parameter learning using MLE, maximum likelihood estimate, which is a down way of doing Bayesian learning. The best thing is to do Bayesian learning. Second best is to do MAP approximation. The third best is to do MLE. And MLE works only when the data is large. To the extent you don't know the data is large, you want to find a way of sort of, you know, putting in some little bit of fixes so that at nine ways classifier will be to them. Do you see what I'm just saying? So you know what's the right thing to do? You do the thing that is easy to do, but then you start having nightmares, so you start putting little fixes. This little fix happens to have a very nice name. And again, you know, this stuff is obvious to you. This is what I was telling you, that you don't want to jump to the conclusion that uh, a coin is unfair um, because it came you know, three times heads in the first three times I passed the coin. But if it did come you know, 3,000 times heads when I passed it 3,000 times, then you want to believe that it's an unfair one. So you want to somehow do your ratios such that for the small data case, the ratios won't become zeros. They would sort of allow for some existence of a price. You see what I'm saying? That happens to be called Laplacian smooth. Okay? Um, so full day based network learning actually does this in a matter of course, but what Laplacian smoothing does essentially is when you are trying to compute this probability, probability that the attribute i has a value vj, given the class variable i equal to true, let's say. Normally, you are just supposed to say what is the number of times the class variable is true in the denominator, number of times class variable is true, and the attribute has that value in the numerator. And done. What you would really like to do is add a little to the numerator, add a little to the denominator. If you need to just fix it, you add a little number to the numerator and denominator, you won't get zeros. So then having done that, you make a theory for it. And say the theory actually comes from Bayesian learning. You could say that before you were told what the class is, if an attribute has 10 values, you have a prior maybe, saying all the values of the attributes are equally possible. So that means if an attribute AI has 10 values, then the probability that, prior probability that you take one of those values is 1 over 10. So I will act as if the examples that you are showing me is not the first time I started seeing examples. I am an experienced guy. I've been around. And I've seen other examples. These virtual examples that I dreamed of, where attributes essentially take their values equal to the prior, which is, you know, attribute takes the value, uh, the first value, if it has 10 values, with one tenth probability. Do people see what I just said? Okay? So, how many uh, such virtual examples do I make? I'll make M virtual examples. And then, if I have M virtual examples and I don't know the class, then M times P of them are the ones 
where the attribute will have that particular value. You see, where I set P normally to be just, I mean, P is supposed to be your prior on how attributes takes values without looking at the class distribution. Okay, so one simple thing to do is just assume that attributes take values in the uniform distribution. Okay, if you do that, then in a sense, you would have, let's say, you know, let's say I take uh, 10 examples, you know, 100 extra examples, let's say, and then uh, the attribute has 10 values, so 100 times 1 over 10 of them will take a specific value, VJ, for that. I act as if I've seen those two, plus I've seen the real examples. This is smoothing. It's not actually just representing the data. It's representing the data plus some virtual examples that you think might have been there. The advantage of doing this is A, you won't get zeros. And remember, zeros are forever. And B, the other thing is if you wind up seeing real examples, if you see a million real examples, then adding 100 examples extra is not going to change the ratio. Do people see this? So in big data case, actually it does become MLEAC. In the small data case, it ensures that you won't get overfit parameter values. Most people just do this thing, and yeah, no, I just want to avoid zero sample. But you, being smart, realize that this is what Bayesian learning will actually be doing. In fact, for this particular kind of distributions, multinomial distributions, the way to do Bayesian learning, none of whatever I'm going to say in the next one minute may not make sense to you, the way to do Bayesian learning would be to assume a prior uh, called beta distribution, which happens to be conjugate of multinomial distribution. Okay, and it turns out then that one of the conjugate the points of the conjugate is you start with the prior of a particular form, you multiply it with the likelihood, it will still be in the same form. It will still be in the same beta distribution. <coughs> and if you do the entire math with the you know, um, integration, etc., you will see that what it will wind up doing is something like essentially adding these virtual examples. So there's a lot of math that actually justifies what we do. But you just think of it as, yeah, I just want to get Okay? Questions? Yes? How do we decide this prior? Yes? Go ahead. How do we decide this prior in this case? No. The, you, basically, how do you decide priors ever? That's supposed to be based on prior knowledge. So, for example, if that AI is, let's say, you know, a particular attribute of the skin condition, let's say, and the values are normal skin, skin with lesions, skin with blood pouring out, skin with all sorts of things. If you think all of them are equally possible for TP patients coming into your office, you'll assume it's one over the number of values. If you think some are much more possible than the others, you then put that. That's your prior knowledge, these priors. Okay? Um, any other questions? So what I'm Running to do if I can is to do that uh, um, attendance thing so that you can do your. Uh, I, I suddenly realized that I'm actually, I supposedly have twice the size of a class I have been doing here. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I should take a picture just so that you can see. <laughs> because I, I never knew I had been Do you want me to do it here, Doctor? No, it's not. Okay. Uh, so, the, any other questions on this one? Okay. Uh, so, while we are going on this, one other thing that I want to mention is why does Mary Base work? You are making huge assumptions. Why does it work? It's the same reason, why does linearity assumption work in the world? It's easy. Okay. So in fact, there's a beautiful paper by Pedro Domingos 
uh, which basically points out that the posterior distribution of the class given the attributes is completely off. If the real class distribution is let's say 0.51 and 0.49, that is class is yes with 0.51 and no with 0.49. Nine days classifier might say 0.99 and 0.41. It's as far from the real probabilities as you can get. But the order is right. So if you just take who is winning, you will still be right. That actually winds up happening in nine days classifier. It's sucky in actually doing the distribution. But it turns out to be less sucky in picking the winner. So you wind up using it. One other thing is um, nine base classifier is completely generative. So even though I have been thinking of giving the attributes, then asking for the test data, I give the attribute values and I ask you for the class. That's what I've been saying. But I could actually give class and some of the attributes and ask you what are the rest of the attributes. Nothing stops me from doing that. And it's completely fine. Okay? Yes? But you only need the class. No, you don't even need that. I mean, it's a, it's a base network. Okay? So you can always give evidence on some of the nodes and ask for the evidence on the rest of the nodes. The posterior on the rest of the nodes. So class may well be of interest to you, but for base network, everything is just a little bit. That's the beauty of generating models. Okay? Uh, let me start this up. <coughs> and then, um, <coughs> let us start the question. Continuous. 
You can combine both of them. Right? It's great, all well and good. The question is, how are you going to decide if I have two topologies, which is a better one? I told you, you could do this by testing in the end, but you don't want to wait for testing. You know, when you're learning, you want to come up with the best topology and the parameters for it and say, I'm done now. So you can test me in this. So if you're doing this, an idea would be that you want to compare two topologies in terms of the likelihood they give to the data. You see what I'm saying? So I have topology T1, topology T2. For both of them, I compute the parameters because it's very easy to compute the parameters. Then using them, I actually connect, I basically estimate the likelihood they give to the training data. And the one that gives the higher likelihood probably is the truth. That's what we've been looking at. That's what MLE will tell you. Right? That's what you know, uh, the maximum likelihood estimate is supposed to tell you, which is figuring out which hypothesis gives higher likelihood to the data. To the extent you think it's a reasonable thing to do, you should now then realize that actually it won't work. Because if you have two topologies, T1, which is a network, T2, which is the same network with one extra edge, one extra edge, that's it. So it's a super set of edges in this network. This which one do you think will give higher, without even knowing the topology? You know, I just said this is T1, this is T2, which is T1 plus an extra edge. Which one do you think will give higher likelihood to the rate? The one with more edges will always give higher likelihood to the data. This is what we meant by saying, you know, if you put more edges, you can always overfit to the data. You said this in neural networks too. If you put too many layers, you could overfit. But you didn't know exactly how that is happening. Here you know, because if you put extra edges, the likelihood cannot reduce. It can only increase for the data. Because as you put more and more edges, you will do a better and better job of memorizing the data. But unfortunately, if you're going to be checked on your memory, you would build. But I'm not going to check on your memory. I'm going to check on test data, which you haven't seen. So you can lose very badly. So then you need to then talk about which topologies are more likely, which topologies are less likely. That's the prior and the hypothesis. And if we talk about that, very similar. One way you could do that essentially is to add a penalty to the network topology based on the number of edges it has. So I'm willing to look for a bigger network if the higher likelihood it gives to the data is offset by the penalty I'm going to give because you have to do edges. It's the same thing that you would do in terms of fitting curves to points on the space. You know, you are willing to go out of uh, straight lines and start looking for higher order polynomials only if it is clear to you that that will actually wind up being, you know, there's a higher prior that in fact that's the, what the data is supposed to be. Okay? So that's basically the only thing that you need to understand about learning topologies. So you search over topologies and you just don't search over topologies, you search over topologies with a penalty. The penalty is the regularization. And again, I mentioned this probably, I didn't probably mention it, I don't know, I did FLS enough probably, but regularization in machine learning to stop overfitting, it's nothing but doing MAP. If you look at MAP, it has the prior part and the data likelihood part. And the MLE ignores the prior part. We talked about it last time. And it's basically bringing that prior back, he's saying some, some Hypotheses are more likely to begin with. Some hypotheses are less likely to begin with. And I start with this prejudice, but if the data tells me to still go for the harder hypothesis, I will go. So it's okay. a regularization. Yes, sir. Why not do the same thing we do with neural networks and reserve an evaluation set and see which one says the evaluation set is most likely? You could do that, but that's basically that way. So the idea is that 
that will require, I mean, so that's basically not having a theory and saying, I'll try to learn lots and lots of different hypotheses and see which one will work better. For that, you don't need this course. In fact, most machine learning people don't take this course. They just call themselves machine learning people. Okay, and then start doing some random stuff. And semantics are like the second order, it turns out. Okay, so you could do that, but you could do it much more efficiently if you learn the right thing first. Then you're more likely to be actually doing well on the test. Good question. Okay. The last thing I want to say is a pretty darn interesting point. I mean, everything is interesting, but it's the mm. last point anyway. Um, suppose you're using an IBM based classifier on the Russell data. Okay? I gave you some amount of labeled data. But I stored, I found out that back in the, in the when I was it, I have some more Russell examples. I just happened to have them hanging around. I don't know whether in those cases he wound up waiting or not waiting. <coughs> would you like me to give you those? Do you want, would you think that you can use this unlabeled data <coughs> to improve your learning? So if you don't like Russell like restaurant thing, think of these as these are all you know fraudulent versus non-fraudulent credit card transactions. Some of them are labeled, I know whether they were fraudulent or not. Others I happen to know they took place, I don't quite know whether they were finally fraudulent or not. I want to give this to you. Would you like it? And you say, eh, leave me alone. I don't really want it. Remember the math textbooks? They used to give a whole bunch of exercises. Those were the bad things, right? I mean, the, one of the good things about going into grad school and undergraduate school is we'll give you one example and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and because you have such background knowledge, you can just learn so much from that background knowledge. Okay. But in the old math textbooks, they will have a huge number of exercises at the end of the textbook. And then they were sort of massive, they were kind of sadist. They will say, answers are only provided to the odd numbered problems. Some of the more lazier ones will say answers are only provided to the prime number problems. <laughs> Why the heck did you give me the rest of the problems? Why do I need them? Can I sell a textbook without those other problems and will people buy it? If you ask yourself that question, you basically know the answer. People who do actually well in understanding the math wind up doing these other problems without solutions. Okay, some of you are here. The rest of the people, there are other people who say enough, you know, for the ones that there's a solution, I can write the solution down and give it in the homework and that way that they are getting it. And hopefully some of you, some of those people are not here. I'm hoping. Okay. But in general, this sort of thing can happen. Especially, let's say if you're thinking in terms of pictures, internet is full of pictures. Some of them are cats, but not all of them are cats. Somebody has to say what's in the picture so that your neural network can learn what are cats 